Hi, I'm Felix Mena, and welcome to another edition of MyGunDiary.com. Today I'm going to share with you my entire Russian firearms arsenal, dating from 1933 all the way up to 1955. I've got a model 1895 Nagant revolver, and I've got a, a model uh, SKS 1955 Tula arsenal a semi-automatic firearm, and everything in between. Uh, I first got into Russian rifles because I really am a World War II history buff, and then I found out that uh, Russian rifles are the most affordable to get started collecting. The 9130 starts around $120 to $140. When I first got into it, they were down around $100 to $109. So I really got addicted to them. As you can see before me, I've got quite a few firearms. We're going to talk about all of them. We're going to talk about the ammunition they shoot, and we're going to talk about the different specifics and a little bit of the history of each of the firearms as well. So thanks for joining me, and uh, have some fun with me today with my Russian arsenal. All right, first we're going to talk about the, we're going to go in chronological order. We're going to first talk about the oldest uh, firearm that I have in terms of the model. It's the model 1895 Nagant revolver. It shoots a 7.62 by 38 uh, cartridge, which is very unique. In fact, this entire pistol is extremely unique. For its time, it was state of the art. Um, one of the issues with revolver is that when you shoot a revolver, gas escapes between the cylinder and the barrel. Uh, but this designer uh, fixed that and I'll show you with a, a little action here. When you pull the hammer back, the cylinder actually moves forward, creating a seal between the cylinder and the barrel. And what that does is that prevents the gas from escaping, and thereby it keeps more pressure in the barrel, and you get a higher velocity shot fired through the firearm. Now, the round that it shoots, the cartridge, is also unique. As you see here, I don't know if you get a good look there, the bullet, the lead, is down inside the cartridge. In fact, it doesn't even stick up at all through the top of the, of the, um, the casing here. And the reason for that is the same as the reason for why they designed the barrel to move forward, is they wanted to maximize the amount of pressure created when this round goes off. And in fact, they, they did that. This is one of the highest velocity shooting revolvers of its time. Uh, it's a seven shot uh, revolver. One other unique feature about this firearm is that the barrel does not rotate out like a lot of revolvers. To load it, you push this lever down, and that'll expose the uh, barrels here, and you load them one at a time, like so. But since the barrel doesn't come out, it makes removing the spent cartridge casings uh, quite a difficult proposition. And you do that by rotating this uh, lever out, rotate it a, about a half a turn, it pulls out, and then this entire mechanism slides forward. And what that allows you to do then is push the rounds out of the cylinder. Um, I took this to the range for the first time yesterday, and I'll include some video uh, of that towards the end here. And it's, it's really inconvenient and a slow process to push out each spent cartridge casing this way. But for 1895, it was way ahead of its time. Uh, it was fun to shoot, uh, just for the historical aspect, but I will warn you that the, I, I don't recommend shooting it in the double action. The, the trigger pull, the tension is very heavy. It takes a lot of force to shoot that with the double action. And it takes a lot of force to cock that hammer down for the single action. But once it's in the single action position, it's not much of a trigger pull at all to, to release the trigger and fire the shot. But don't expect this hammer to come down easy when you pull it down. And don't expect anything but a heavy trigger pull when you pull it the double action. It's really hard to do. Um, but it's quite a unique pistol and this is the model 1895 uh, Nagant revolver. You'll see it in the opening scenes of the movie Enemy at the Gates uh, when the boat is crossing the Volga River and some Russian soldiers are jumping out to, to try to get away uh, and their own officers shoot them with uh, the uh, Nagant revolver. Uh, this one is made in the Tula factory in 1938 and uh, that's my oldest model um, Russian firearm, the 1895 Nagant Revolver. Walker is heavy. The, the pull, huh? Yes. All right, next we're moving on to the infamous model 9130 Mosin Nagant rifle. Uh, this is uh, one of the most iconic firearms in all of history. And I'll give you a little background about the 9130. It is based off of the model 1891. Now what are the differences between the model 91 and the 9130? 
Well, first of all, the Model 91 was a little bit longer. It's hard to believe because the 9130 is 48 and a half inches long, whereas the Model 1891 was 50 inches long. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the rifle sight here is in meters. It goes from 100 up to 2,000 meters. And the Model 1891 went by another unit of measure called the Arshin, which is uniquely Russian. But for the Model 9130, they changed it to uh, meters. So this goes from 100 to 2,000 meters. And you adjust it simply by pushing in and sliding it up and down. And that's how that works. Uh, so when they came out with the Model uh, 9130, originally all of the receivers were hexagonal. So this is commonly known as a hex receiver. And later on, they went to just a straight round receiver. And there's a lot of debate if there's any difference between the hex receiver and the round receiver, but there's really not. I've fired them both, and they, they shoot the same. The, uh, the steel is just as strong in the hex as it is in the round and vice versa. So uh, this is a 1933 Tula model. Um, I, I, this is the first Tula uh, rifle that I ever purchased. I always wanted one. And the Tula Arms Factory is the original arms factory uh, that they were making these in, and then later the factory in Izhevs started making 9130s as well. And we're going to look at a model 9130 from the Izhevs factory next. But this is my 1933 Tula 9130. All right, next up we have a 1939 Tula, and this uh, 9130 is unique in that it's got a stamp on the receiver stamped XO. And I've done a lot of research on the internet about it, and I can't find anywhere uh, that where people know what the XO means. Now, there's quite a few 9130s that have MO stamped on them, and that stands for Ministry of Defense. But no one knows what the XO means. So when I saw this rifle online, I bought it on gunbroker.com, I knew I wanted it immediately. One, because it's a Tula manufacturer. Two, because you, if you just look closely at the quality of the workmanship here, this round receiver is smooth and beautiful. Uh, and three, because of this unique marking on it. I think it's just going to give it more value as a collector's item later on, and uh, it definitely makes for a unique piece. So this is a model 9130-1939 Tula, and it's one of my favorite. All right, next up we have one of the most common, the most common variant of the 9130, is the model 1943 Izhevs. The Russians made tens of millions of these during World War II, and after the war they put them away in uh, crates. They, covered them in cosmoline, they refurbished them if they needed to. And these are the majority of the ones that you're going to find on the market today for the $120 to $140 range. One thing we'll get a look at a little bit later on is the you'll notice how the quality of the finish on the receivers uh, it goes down quite a bit uh, because in 1943 the Germans were closing in on uh, on uh, Stalingrad, they were closing in on Moscow, they were just you know running over the Russians and they had to pump out these rifles as fast as they could. Now the inner workings of the rifle are all the same as any of the other models, but they didn't bother taking the time to finish the receivers very well, and we'll get a close-up look at the difference between, say, a Model 1939 uh, and a Model 1943. Uh, this was the very first Mosin Nagant that I ever purchased, and uh, it's still my favorite to shoot. I shoot the heck out of it, and uh, it's a lot of fun, Model 1943. Okay, next up we have a Model 1944. Uh, 9130. Now what's the difference between a 1944 and a 1943? Well, not much difference really. I knew I had a problem as a collector when I purchased this 1944 because I originally purchased it as a gift for a friend of mine. Uh, and when I took it home and got it out of the box, I noticed that it was a 1944. Well, I didn't have a 1944 in my collection, so I said, you know, my friend's not getting this one. I'm going to go back and buy him another one. And sure enough, that's what I did. I went back to the store. I bought another Mosin Nagant. It was a 1943. I already have a 1943, so that's the one I gifted to my friend. And I kept the model 1944 for myself. But now's a good time where we're going to talk about the cartridge that the 9130 shoots. And that is a 7.62 by 54 rimmed cartridge. And this is this cartridge has been in military use longer than any other cartridge that's still currently being used. They uh, use it in the uh, RPK uh, machine gun uh, and they use it in uh, several other firearms. There's a sniper, the Dragonox I think shoots this one. Uh, it's a huge round. And I've seen videos on YouTube where there's a guy shooting a 9130 with a scope out to a thousand yards and he's hitting a 24 inch target at a thousand yards with this round so it's just a devastating round. If you want to compare it to another modern cartridge 
Here is a 223 cartridge that we shoot in the military or 556 five, NATO round. And you can see the difference in size there. It's just night and day. This one is a giant beast compared to the 223 or 556. Five, but you have to remember that in uh, during those wars, World War I and World War II, they were shooting at greater distances, you know, at distances of 500 to 800 yards at the enemy, whereas now we're in more urban combat environments shooting at closer range. So I just wanted you to get a look at the difference between the cartridges. Top right. Yeah, put it in tight against your shoulder. Yeah, thanks for the warning. Holy hell. Okay, next we're gonna get into the carbines. This is a model M38 carbine. It's a 1943 made in Izhevsk. And what is the difference between a carbine and a 9130? Well, really the only difference is the length. The model 1938 was made much shorter. It's about 42 inches, I believe, 42 and a half inches. Now there are other carbines out there as well. There's a carbine called a model 9159. And what they did with the model 9159 is they just took a model 9130 and cut the barrel shorter and then refinished it. Whereas the M38 and the M44, which we're gonna see in a second, were specifically designed. The barrel was specifically designed for this length. So I preferred, I'm, I'm gonna get a 9159 uh, to add to my collection just for the nostalgia and complete my collection. But as far as shooting, um, I like the model 1938 and the 1944 because they were specifically designed to be a shorter length. The 1938 uh, was not designed with a bayonet. There's no bayonet uh, lug and there's no bayonet attached on the side like the M44 because these were never designed for frontline troops. They were designed for cooks, people in the rear, and things of that nature that uh, they didn't anticipate were going to need a bayonet. But it's a great shooting rifle, shoots the same round, the 762 by 54 and for some reason the carbine length Mosin Nagants are, are the loudest rifles at the rifle range. You're going to get a lot of people, a lot of eyes and heads turning your way when you shoot a carbine uh, Mosin Nagant. They are really loud and uh, that makes it more fun. Usually a lot of flame shoots out the top of these, so that's fun. That's my M38 carbine. All right, moving right along, we have the uh, famous M44 carbine. And what's unique about the M44 carbine is that it comes with a permanently attached bayonet. And uh, at first I was, I didn't, I really wasn't interested in getting an M44 because of that. I thought, you know, it might affect the weight and the balance and the way it shoots. But really, this is one of the most fun rifles to shoot. Uh, let me show you how the bayonet works. Basically, to get the bayonet to fold out, you just pull down and out. And it comes right out. Then you pull the top of it over the top of your barrel there. And that's how you get the bayonet on there. So you can look out for these. These run about uh, anywhere from 250 to 350 bucks. Uh, they're pretty affordable, a lot of fun to shoot. And don't let that bayonet bug you at all. I think it's kind of a cool feature. This one is a model 1946 Izhevsk, and it's just in beautiful condition. Uh, this one I purchased recently as a replacement for the M44 that was stolen when my apartment got broken into a few few months ago. So uh, this one is just as nice as the one I had before. So uh, I haven't shot this one yet, so we'll have to get out and shoot it soon. All right, now we're moving on to semi-automatics. The SKS is a 7.62 by 39 millimeter, 10 round, permanently attached box magazine semi-automatic rifle. It's not the first semi-automatic that the Russians designed and came out with. That one was called the SVT. Um, they're pretty expensive. I don't have one in my collection. Eventually I will. Uh, but the SVT was the first semi-automatic. But we get to the, uh, the SKS, and it's just a, a really cool rifle to shoot. Um, it works this way. Here's the charging handle here. Pull it back to the open position. Now you can load the rounds individually through the top here, or you can load them with a 10-round stripper clip. And I've not really tried the 10-round stripper clip too much because it, the, the few times I tried to get 10 rounds pushed through the stripper clip is not quite as easy as when you do it on a 5-round Mosin Nagant, for example. But this one here is a 1953 Izhevsk, and uh, it's, it's in really nice shape. Uh, the wood is in really great condition. The bayonet's in great condition. It's a ton of fun to shoot, and uh, the SKS is probably my favorite of my uh, Russian rifles to take out to the range and shoot. 
The bolt's quite heavy, so you're going to feel, and so is the rifle, so you're not going to feel a ton of recoil when you shoot it, and uh, that just makes it that much more enjoyable to shoot. So that's my 1953 Izhefs SKS. Okay, next up is my model 1955 Tula SKS. And uh, this one I got from a nice guy down in Centralia, a guy named Jeff, who I uh, bought from on gunbroker.com. And I paid a little bit more than uh, what the going rate is for because Jeff is uh, also a former military service member and he was local and I paid a little extra for the convenience of just driving down to pick it up myself. But as you see, the wood is in really great condition. I really like this dark, dark wood on it. Um, it's just a, a, a blast to shoot. I took it out to the range yesterday. It was a ton of fun. One with my friend Kevin and Lisa who recently moved to the area from Phoenix and now live in Portland. So I took them out and we shot a bunch of the rifles. But this is the 1955 Tula SKS. This one I purchased as a replacement for my SKS which was stolen along with several other firearms. So I've got a special attach attachment to this one and I'm going to hang on to this one hopefully a little longer than my one that got stolen. Okay, I saved the best for last. This is a model 1943-9130 sniper rifle uh, made famous by Vasily Saitsev in the movie Enemy at the Gates. This one is not an original sniper rifle. It's a reproduction scope. It's made in Russia, but it wasn't made during World War II and wasn't issued during World War II. They put these together afterwards, but it's as close as you can get uh, and they're really affordable. So it is the same scope, just made after the war and put on, uh, put on later. Shoot 7.62 by 54. Like I said, I've seen videos where someone's shooting this thing out to a thousand yards uh, and I have yet to go out and shoot it. The uh, features of the scope here, this is your uh, elevation adjustment and unlike most scopes, when you turn it and adjust it, it doesn't click at all. So it's all kind of just done by feel and by hand. There are numbers on it, but there are no clicks. So you'll just have to visually inspect it. And then uh, this is for the windage left and right got two covers here and we'll try to get you a look at the crosshairs later but this is a three post crosshair it's got a post in the middle and two on the side and uh, it's probably good for ranges out to say 800 yards to a thousand yards although you'd have to have quite a bit of practice uh, at a thousand yards there's a 32 bull 32 foot bullet drop so uh, you're gonna have to be doing some adjusting on your scope but uh, if you watch the movie enemy at the gates you'll definitely get a good look at this weapon uh, I haven't shot it yet, I just got it, and uh, that's why I saved it for last. But this is a model uh, 9130 1943 Sniper. So let me take a minute and talk to you about the cleaning products because it's very important when you're shooting uh, Russian firearms with surplus ammo to uh, do a good job of cleaning them. Uh, the corrosive ammo you'll want to get to with a, uh, a wire brush or a scrub brush somehow. And what I do is I start out with some hops number 9. This is probably the best solvent. Uh, on the market. If you're a firearms enthusiast, you've heard of the Hops brand. But what I do is I'll run uh, a wire brush through the bore with Hops number nine, and then I'll run some clean uh, cleaning cloths through there to get all the gunk and stuff. And usually I go through uh, the bore about uh, two or three times with the hops. Then I move on to the gun scrubber. Now gun scrubber is an excellent cleaning product, and you can get use it to get into all the nooks and crannies that your wire brush isn't going to get into. And the gun scrubber is going to dissolve all that. Uh, fouling and stuff and it's just going to drip right out. So I use this liberally and it's not a lubricant. So once you're, you're done spraying it, it tends to dry up right away. And then as finishing products, I'll use my Remington gun oil and my Remington gun wipes. And this is your lubricant here. So once I've done the hops number nine and the gun scrubber, I go through the, the bore and all the metal parts with some Remington gun oil. And I like it in a can. It's just convenient to spray it right on your parts and spray it down the barrel. And then the, the wipes are very convenient uh, as well. I really like the wipes a lot. And then I finish off my cleaning with a tough cloth. Now, tough cloth is just an unbelievable product that a friend of mine first turned me on to in Kuwait. And why I like to finish my gun cleaning with tough cloth is the, uh, it's a microfiber cloth uh, that does not attract dirt. So one of the problems with leaving your weapons too oiled up is that they're gonna get, uh, attract dirt. The, the oil and the lubricant's gonna attract dirt. But with the tough cloth, it leaves a really nice finish on the rifle without leaving it too oily and uh, it's not going to attract dirt. So basically I just take my tough cloth and I wipe all the parts down. It leaves them looking really nice and shiny, really beautiful. And once I'm done wiping it down with the tough cloth, 
I hang these up on the wall and I just, just enjoy the heck out of them and I enjoy sharing, sharing them with friends. And That's what I wanted to do today is uh, share my Russian rifle collection with you guys. I really thank you for tuning in. This might be the last video before I head off to uh, Korea for a couple of years. Um, I, I mean, I'm going to try to shoot some videos out there, but obviously I won't be going to any ranges other than the, the Army ranges uh, to qualify. So I don't know how much video I'm going to get to shoot. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll see you next time on MyDenDiary.com.